the problem with that it comes is that that I I tend to well, I, I, I tend to think I already know what everybody's thinking because I want everybody there related to me. You follow what I'm getting at? And my feelings towards people just might just assume, you know, that since I've related to them, they probably they got to feel the same way I do about things. But I found out that, that it's not about me and it's not about my it wasn't about my family. It wasn't and, and I've tried to stress this here to among the church membership, not just here but also at the church at Denton. Is that it's, we're all bought by one man's blood. And when we're in this place, that's the relationship that we have to think about. We have to remember that we're all a member of that one family. The family and the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this has a lot to do with what the Apostle Paul was writing about. In this fourth chapter of, the first, of first Timothy, and I, 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 just, I, just, I just feel so identified with the Apostle Paul in this thing. He said, now the Spirit speaketh expressly. I love that expression. Expressly means specifically, clearly, without, without any, 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 uh, any shadow of a doubt. The Spirit of God has spoke expressly that in the latter times. Now, when are the latter times? The latter times started with the, with the death, the burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have been in the latter times for about, about 2,000 years. So don't let, don't get confused, brother and sister, when people come along and talk, talk, talk to you about the latter times. Scripture's talking about in the latter times, they're now. In the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. We have seen that repeated over and over and over in church history. A lot of the problems that churches have have to do with personalities, have to do with misunderstandings, has to do with not following the scripture. We talked about what Brother Randy preached about last Sunday, and I and I, I, I come in behind him about Matthew 18, about following the, the steps of scripture when it has to do with forgiveness, have the necessity that we must be able to forgive. He said, but there was going to be some that would give uh, would depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. A seducing spirit is a lying spirit, a spirit that would lie and deceive. And, and so that there's no misunderstanding about that, brothers and sisters, they come in the form of human beings. They are sometimes, they sometimes carry the title of an elder or a deacon. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, was people we had the most confidence in. But, that, but sometimes we get caught up and in, in, in in deceived by a lying spirit. That's why the, the Apostle Paul encourages us to study he says to Brother Timothy, to study to show thyself approved unto God. It's not, it, I'm not saying that what is said in this stand is not important. It's critical. But it must be weighed against thus saith the Lord. What does the scripture say? What is, what is our attitude toward our study? What's our attitude toward the church? How do we feel about the church? It's, it's, it's Jesus first, others second, and ourselves last. The very first time we put ourselves first, we misspell the word, we lose out of the joy. You can't spell joy by putting Y first. You can't do it. He said they give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. I don't, we don't ever want to lose sight of the word doctrines. It's a word that we use a lot without really stopping to consider what it means. The word doctrine means the teachings of the church. It means teaching and instruction. But, there's a, but he's talking about doctrines of devils. The word, the word devil is a, is, a, is a deceiver. It means deceiver. Deceiving doctrines. Speaking lies and hypocrisy. Basically what it's saying is they live, they, they, they pretend they have a pretense of godliness in your presence. They speak as if they're holy. But in their, in their, in their everyday lives, they're sinful. He said they're speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Forbidding to marry. This is some of the false doctrines that are out in the world. Forbidding to marry. That I, my thought goes to Catholicism, where some where they come up with the idea that somehow if you're a single man, that puts you closer to God. It doesn't put you closer to God. It, and, uh, but they forbid to marry. They can say that like, like that. You ever heard an expression that cleanliness is next to godliness? It's a misnomer. It's a, it's a myth. It's, it's the, same, the same type of thinking here. That, uh, uh, that they're forbidding to marry. That if you're, if you're a single married, you can devote all your attention to God. 
uh, and commanded to abstain from meats and God had, which God hath created and, and, and received uh, uh, with thanksgiving to them that believe and know the truth. The, the, to not be tossed about, as Paul said earlier, by every wind of doctrine, that we might study to show ourselves approved, that these things not come, might not come upon us. As we, as, we, as we were in that last chapter, the third chapter, talking about the qualities of the ministry of the deacons. Remember what it said concerning must be the husband of one wife? If, that, if that's a qualification, Paul points this out to us. Then single people are not qualified. But it's not a qualification, it's a quality. He said, for every creature of God is good. How do I know that? Because I have taken the time to go back and read the scriptures. If you want to take the time to go back to Genesis chapter 1, you'll find that when God created everything, and when I say everything, I'm talking about the serpent. The serpent was included in here. He said it was, it was not only good, but it was very good. Now, I, I'm not going to try to uh, explain that today concerning sa Satan, but at some point uh, uh, before, the, before the fall of man, everything was good and very good. Uh, but we won't go into that. He said that nothing is to be refused. So if somebody comes to you and tells you, uh, you, you have to keep some kind of law, some kind of ritual, ritualistic law. He said everything that God has created is good. It's not to be refused. It's not to be turned away. If it be received with thanksgiving, he said, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Sanctified. Sanctified means to be to set aside for a holy purpose and holy use. Now keep your finger there and let's go to the, the 10th chapter of the book of Acts and I want to see that put into practice. You see a lot of times, Brother Sister, we, uh, uh, we, when we're, we're searching the scripture, trying to study the scripture, listening to the preaching of the gospel, we have trouble with the application. We need to see it modeled for us. Uh, we're, we are, after all, children of God. And, and in the 10th chapter, and I'll begin to read this, i got a lot to read here today. He said, there was a certain man uh, it, it, uh, that word certain means specific, chosen, and set aside. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, and Cornelius' name means horn. The horn under the law, the trumpet, was, call, was one that, that called us to battle, but it also called us to worship. It was it, the sound of the horn. He said the name was Cornelius, a centurion, and uh, that's the captain of a hundred. He was the captain of the, uh, the centurion of the band that was called the Italian band, so his regiment, if you will, was called the Italian band. And the scriptures said, we need to pay attention to these words. And he said he was a devout man. What do we mean when we say he was a devout man? The word devout means that he was a worshipful man. He was a godly man. Notice, what, what, notice we're talking about a Gentile here. And we're talking about before, uh, uh, before the advent of of the gospel he preached to him before he was preached to. He was already a devout man and one that feared God with all of his house. Now, if I didn't know better, I would be, I'd be willing to tell you that he had a church in his house. And everybody in his house, including his servants, were all bought by one man's blood. But the majority of the people in his house, they were related to one another. They, this is his family. And so they prayed to God always. Now, if I haven't accomplished anything in the short time that I have been among you, I hope I've taught you what this word always means. Not always, but always, without the S on the end. Remember, always is like a straight and continual line. And while there's nothing wrong with that, the word always is a deeper meaning to it. it it's, it's an infinite amount of lines pointing in infinite different directions for eternity. It means in every way that's possible. In every way that's it's not even conceivable. He said he, they prayed to God in every way that was possible. They worshiped God in every way that was possible. Gentiles. And he said he saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour. What's the ninth hour? The ninth hour, we're talking about the ninth hour of the day, it's 3 p.m. And the angel of the Lord God coming in, in to him, saying unto him, Cornelius. Brothers and sisters, he was praying. And you can remember what, uh, what, the, what the writer of the Hebrew letter in the 13th chapter of the, big, the book of Hebrew, you find over there, if you go over there and look in the, in the 13th chapter, he said, be, be not careful to entertain strangers. 
For in so doing, brother, should we some entertain angels unaware. Sometimes that's talking about heavenly creatures. Sometimes it's just talking about preachers. But we're talking about heavenly messengers here. So he had a vision about three in the afternoon about an angel that came to speak to him. It said when he looked upon him, he was afraid. And I think that's a, a, I think that's a lot of a, 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 a lot way of saying it terrified him. I mean, imagine putting yourself in his place. An angel of the Lord appeals, appears to you and said, he said, what is it, Lord? In other words, what's this all about? He said, terrified. Why have you appeared to me? And he said unto him, thy prayers and thy alms will come up as a memorial, come up as a memorial before God. Do we think that God pays attention to the things that we do? Yes, he does. In fact, he said here, the angel tells uh, this devout uh, uh, Gentile man, your, your prayers and your alms, you all remember what alms means? It means doing good deeds, doing good works. Your good works have come up as a memorial to God. God takes notice to the things that we do. It's not going to, we can't work our way to heaven, but he does pay attention to what we do. He said, now send men therefore to Joppa. Joppa means beautiful. Go to the city that's called Beautiful and call for one Simon, the tanner. Uh, that, uh, uh, the word, the word uh, 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 Simon is a wonderful name. Uh, it, means, uh, it means Jehovah has heard. Now you just think about these things. A lot of folks won't give you this information. But look at the, look at the words. A man, a, a, a devout man, a Gentile, who's been praying to God, an angel calls him uh, and says, I want you to send to a, a beautiful city. And I want you to go, main, go to a man that his name means God has heard you. Think about that. You couldn't arrange that if you tried. And he said, uh, and his surname is Peter. That means a rock, a pebble, a small stone. And he lodges with another man. Guess what his name is? Also his name is Simon. God has heard. So he wants to go to a man who God has heard, Jehovah has heard, and into a man's house who, whose name means God has heard. And he said he's a tanner whose house uh, is by the seaside. He lived on, he lived on the beach. And, and, and he will tell thee what thou oughtest to do. This word oughtest here is an imperative. It means it's necessary. This is, the, the angel's not telling uh, uh, Cornelius, this is something I think you ought to go do. This is something that's necessary for you to go do. And besides, if an angel were to appear to you and say, I think you ought to do this, do you think you ought to? Sure you do. If, if, if the angel of the Lord came and told you, he said, when the angel spake to Cornelius, uh, was departed. When he left, he called, and I want you to notice this too. He calls two of his household servants. Two. Out of the mouth of two or three, let every word be established. <clears throat> and waited on him as an a devout soldier. He called for another fellow laborer, a devout soldier. That two, two plus one is equal to what? Three. Now we've got that holy number that represents God. He said, a devout soldier of them that waited on him continue. This word waiting means served together with him. And when he had declared the things unto them, he sent them down to Joppa. And on the morrow, the next morning, as they went on their journey, they drew nigh to the city. So if you, in your mind's eye, if you can imagine, they're, they're traveling, you know, they didn't have a car, and they didn't have a chariot. They're on foot walking down to the city of Joppa. And while they're coming up to the gate, Peter was up on the housetop and he prayed about the sixth hour. Sixth hour is noon, it's lunchtime. And, and he became very hungry. Let me, let, me, let me say something here. I can't prove this, but I'll tell you what I think. The reason that he was particularly very hungry, I believe that, that, that Peter had been fasting. And people are always asking me, Brother Thomas, I see that the fasting is talked about in the scripture. What's the significance of it? And here's an illustration of the, the significance of fasting. Fasting will not get you to heaven. It doesn't make you perfect. But in my own experience, I've noticed that sometimes if I fast on Sunday morning and Saturday night, it seems like, my, it seems like I have a more deeper sense of the Spirit because I'm not focusing any longer upon myself. I've, I've took my mind off of, the, of, of eating and drinking and focused upon the things of the Lord. I think that's what Peter was doing here. And, see, and he became hungry and would have eaten. See, he's at the end of a fast. That's what I think. So if you leave and don't try to find this in the scripture, you can't find and prove this. That's my opinion. And while they made ready, 
He fell into a trance. Something had happened to him. You remember what, you remember what Jesus said about fasting in the 16th chapter of the book of Matthew? He said, when you fast, don't be like the hypocrites. You know, they go around fasting with a sour countenance. They, they, they draw out their faces so that when you look at him, say, he must be fasting. Look at his face. He said, but when you fast, uh, uh, he said, wash your face. Comb your hair. Put on your aftershave. It, that mean when they see you, they don't know you're fasting. That's what he's saying. And he saw, he saw heaven open. If they're coming up to the gate now, the three men, the two devout, that one devout man and the two, the two servants, three of them, that come to the city now, he saw a curtain, he saw a sheet uh, descending unto him as it had been a sheet, knit at four corners, put together in four corners, let down to the earth, wherein was all manner of four-footed beasts. The word four-footed beast tells me we're not talking about people here. We're talking about animals, animals, full of animals of the earth. And wild, wild beast. When he says, when he's talking about wild beast, he's talking about this word wild here is talking about dangerous. The Greek word means to be venomous, almost like a serpent. Uh, so I want you to think about this. I want you to imagine for just a few minutes the sheet open and what, the, what he's seeing here. Snakes, bugs, creeping things. The creeping things, mice, uh, lizards. I mean, not a pretty picture here. I mean, how many of us are, are got in the habit of eating bugs? Worms, creeping things, and fowls of the air. And, he, and I, I want you to notice something too. He said, and there came a voice to him and said, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Now, number, he said, all manner. All manner tells me they were both uh, clean animals and they were intermingled with unclean animals. That's what it tells me. Now, I know a lot of people think this is just talking about a bunch of unclean animals. I think they're intermingled there. And Peter looked at all of them. I'm sure he saw the clean animals and the unclean. And Peter said, Not so, Lord. Uh, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. He said, Now that one, this one, that one, this one. I've never eaten any of those. I will never do that. That never, never entered into my mouth. And the voice spake to him again a second time. What God had cleansed. See, they're mixed together. They're mixed together. And God has put them together. The, the clean and the unclean ceremony. They put them together. He said, what I clean, don't you call common. He said, it's not unclean. Now the whole is clean. Everything that's in the sheep. What did, what did, what did uh, Paul say? It's not to be refused. It's not to be refused. And this was done three times. He's got three witnesses coming to him now. And he saw a vision. And three times he saw the same vision. Here's that number three again. And the vessel received up again into heaven. Done three times. Came down three times. And now when Peter doubted, notice that he doubted about this. This is something he doubted about. What does this mean? And when Peter doubted in himself, what this vision, uh, uh, what this vision which he had seen should mean, well, Lord, what do you, what do you mean by the, the answer was at the door? And behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius made inquiry at Simon's house and stood before the gate. Now they're right outside the door there, outside the house. <clears throat> and they called, and they asked whether Simon, called Jehovah has heard, which is surnamed Peter, was lodged there. It's important that we understand that they, they knew what they were asking for. They didn't, they didn't they know what Simon asked for. There's two Simons there. Simon the Tanner, and there's also Simon called Peter. And they, the angel told him specifically not to Simon the Tanner, as for Simon who's called Peter. And while Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. There's that three. Three events here of threes. Three of three. And they said, Arise, therefore, and get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Now, from the very instant that I read that Cornelius was a devout man, I already knew that the Lord was going to send them down there. That's, that's indication when you read the word devout and they go, the Lord has sent them. The Lord does, does not send the natural man. He sends his children. And he said, and then Peter went down unto the men which were coming to him in the, from Cornelia and said, behold, I am, uh, behold, I am he whom you see. <clears throat> For what is the cause where you are come? See, God had told him, the Spirit had told him, you know, don't be doubtful about this, Peter. These men have come for me. Now Peter just wants to know one thing. What's, it, what's your purpose? What's you coming for? I know God has sent you. What's what you here for? And they said, Cornelius, 
a centurion of a, and a just man, one that feared God, and of good report among the nation of Jews. You know, they were good. He was a good neighbor. He was a good neighbor. Was warned of God by a holy angel to send uh, for thee into his house to hear words of thee. He said, he's, you know, remember what he said? He's going to tell you what thou oughtest to do. He said, we come here for that purpose. Then he called them in and lodged them. And on the morrow, the next morning, Peter went away with them. And certain uh, brethren, that's, so here's that word certain again, specific and selected and set aside. Brethren, he chose three witnesses from the church to go with him as witnesses. Uh, that from Joppa, they went to company and they went back to Cornelius. And on the morrow, they traveled overnight, I suppose, and the next day after, they entered into Caesarea. And Cornelius waited on them, waiting for them. There he was, waiting for them. And he called together, <clears throat> listen, who came together, his kinsmen and his near friends. What is, what, what is in the church? That, what, is, what, are we, what is in the church? It's kinsmen and near friends. Near friends, brothers and sisters. Uh, the kinsmen and near friends are all those that are bought by one man's blood, the blood of Jesus Christ. There's a church there. And he said, and Peter was coming in, and Cornelius met him, and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. Now let me clarify something to you. If, if, if we're to worship Peter, this is a good opportunity to show that, isn't it? You know, the world, uh, sometimes in different worldly religions, they got this thing about worshipping Peter or worshipping Mary. Now, if, they, if this be the case, here's an opportunity to set that straight. He said, well, see here, Brother Car Cornelius is worshipping Peter. And, but Peter took him up. You know what he said? He grabbed him. Probably right around his top of his shoulder there. Grabbed him. And, and saying, stand up. I myself am also a man. If we're supposed to worship Peter, this would be a good opportunity for Peter to say, that's right. Here, kiss my hand. Kiss my feet. He didn't do that. And as he, as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were coming together. I can tell you from my own personal experience, and I'm, no doubt you have had the same experience, have you ever been to one of those meetings and you come in and many of the brethren are there and you have your heart just is lifted up and you rejoice to enter into with the God's, God's people and, and a good church meeting? That's what we're seeing here. And he said unto them, Know ye how that it is an unlawful thing. This English word here is the word in the Greek that means an abomination. An abomination. I'm not talking about politics here. But it's, a, it's an unclean thing. It's unlawful. It's, un, it's ungodly. It's an ungodly thing for a man that is of a Jew. Where did he get that from? Where did, where did they get the idea that they were they, that it was an unlawful thing to go and, and visit with a Gentile? As I read the scriptures, the scripture told us uh, uh, that when we when we harvest our crops, that we are to leave the outer edges for the poor and the strangers. You know who the strangers are? People of other nations. They might come in and have something to eat. When they, when they come to your house, you, you, they, they were be under the same, same laws and, and protections that were afforded them under the law. Where did they get this from? They didn't get it from God. They got it from their traditions. We need to be weary of our tradition. We need to be asking ourselves about tradition. Do our traditions, do they, do they line up with us, saith the Lord? Or do we have traditions that contradict or hinder us in our worship of God. Those are things we need to be considered. He said, but it's an unlawful thing. He got this from the Talmud, by the way. It's an unlawful thing for a Jew to keep company or come into a, a, under one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. God had, had told him, don't call anything common or unclean. Let's go to the 11th chapter. No, let's go to the 10th chapter of the book of Luke. And I'll pick up with the 25th verse and continue on this same thought. He said, Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and, tempt, and tempted him, tempted Christ, saying, Master, what, shall I, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? See, he already knows this guy, he's a man of ritual. See, we, don't, we, we need to be real careful. Even in, the, in our churches, brothers and sisters, that our religion has become some kind of ritual thing that we do just because that's what we do. Our, 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 our way of life as old Baptists 
to something that we are, something that we live, and something that we, we, we believe and we, and we put into practice on a day-to-day -day basis. And he answered him and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right. You got the right answer. This do, and thou shalt live. But he, that is the lawyer, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, Who is my neighbor? Let's ask the question to ourselves this morning. Who's our neighbor? Who's our neighbor? Is, is our neighbor only the people we see in church on Sunday? Who is our neighbor? Is it only those who agree with us? Yeah, I love people that agree with me, by the way, just in case you're wondering. If you agree with me, I'm on, I like you. But listen to what he's saying. And Jesus answered and said, A certain man, here's that word certain again, specific, selected, particular, special. A certain man went down from Jerusalem. When I find he's come from Jerusalem to Jericho, now I'm, 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 I'm going to jump to a conclusion and say he was worshiping there. This could easily be, this could be Cornelius. He said he went down from, from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves. And they stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Half dead means he's not completely dead, but he's in pretty bad shape here. And by chance, that's why I don't like the chance system, that God gives everybody a chance. I, it, what would happen to this guy here if, we had, if he was just left up to a chance? Let's look at the chance. By chance there came down a certain priest, a particular priest, a certain priest, a specific priest, that way. And when he saw him, Walking up, he said, oh, what is that? That's a, oh, that's a, is he dead? He said he passed by on the other side. If he was there on this side of the road, he went as far on the other side of the road as he could go to keep having to come in contact with this guy. Likewise, a Levite, another priest, when he, when he came to the same place he looked on, this guy, at least he stopped, but looked, and said, well, yeah, I can't tell if he's breathing or not. But he passed by, he said, I'm not going to stay over here, I'm going to go back to the other side. He went on to the other side. But a certain Samaritan, See, we need to understand something about the Samaritan. The Samaritans are hated by the Jews. These are half-breeds. Remember the old term, half-breeds? They're half-Jewish and half-Gentile. And the Jews despise the Samaritans. They hate the Samaritans. So when, in an instant, Jesus said, but a Samaritan, I could just almost see the faces of the listeners. They thought, what? A Samaritan? A, Samar a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, when he saw him, he had compassion. This word compassion, he had mercy. He's not, it's not just a feeling he's having. He's going to do something about how he's feeling here. He said he went to him, bound, lifted up his head, he bound his wounds, he poured oil and wine uh, on, uh, on, in, uh, in the wound and sat upon his own beast. Took it, he, he, maybe he was riding on that beast, I don't know. But he got off and he put this poor man on that beast to, and he brought him to an inn. So he stopped by a Holiday Inn or whatever, you know, that was in Israel. And he took care of him there. He said on, on the morrow, the next morning, he had to proceed on to, to on his travel. Do we, know who this, do we know who this Samaritan is a picture of? It's Christ, the Samaritan. He, he's the God of the Jew and the God of the Gentile. He, if, if you have it this way, he's the perfect Samaritan. He, he's both Jew and Gentile. He's, he took us in together. And when he departed, see, our master has went into heaven's glory world. He's departed. And he's left us to care in the end. The end is the church. And he took out two pence. And he gave them to the host, to the manager. And he said, it'll take care of him. You see, we're supposed to be caring for one another in church. And whatsoever thou spendest more, you're not going to be able to outspend God. I want you to know right now. He said, when I come again, I will repay thee. When the Lord comes again, and I'm not necessarily talking about the end of time, but when He comes to us, brothers and sisters, when we care for one another, He will repay us. He will bless the church. And, and, and which now, uh, which now of these three? There's three. Again, there's that number three again. Thinkest thou was a neighbor to him that fell among the thieves. I, I could almost just see this, the man choking on the words. As he said, he that showed mercy upon him. He couldn't even say Samaritan. Did you notice that, Brother Randy? He didn't say it was Samaritan. He couldn't bring himself to say Samaritan. I, mean, I, I didn't see him choking on the words. He said, I want to have mercy on him. 
And, and Jesus said unto him, Go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. We better get back over to Timothy here. He said, let's get where we leave off. Verse 6. He said, For it is sanctified. Let me go back and read it. Every creature of God is good as for, and nothing is to be refused. If it be received with thanksgiving. That also reminds us, we need to live our day-to-day -day life with a thankful heart. We need to look for things day to day. Little things, big things, everything. To be thankful to God for it. Tell God we're thankful for it. For it is sanctified. It is set aside, set aside by the Word of God and prayer. So what are we supposed to be doing? We're supposed to be studying the Word of God and we're supposed to be praying. And if thou, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things. Maybe he's talking to young Timothy here. History, history tells us that Timothy was the pastor of the church at Ephesus. He eventually became the bishop there. He said, if, if thou put the, the brethren in remembrance of these things, the things that I've been telling you, these things, thou, thou, shalt, uh, thou shalt be a good minister, a good pastor of Jesus Christ, nourished up in good words of faith, nourishing up yourself and those that hear you, and good doctrine, good teaching, good instruction, whereunto thou hast attained. You understand that before, before the pastor, before the preacher, can nourish and teach the congregation, he's first got to be nourished and attained in those things. He sets the pace. He's the one that does the studying first. And he sets the pace. He sets the example. But he said, Timothy, refuse profane and old wise fables. You know what a wise fable is? Profane means, means unclean, means un un unceremonial, ceremonial, unclean. Refuse those things. Why, old wise fable. That's 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 uh, that's stories that people have intermingled with a little bit of truth and a little bit of falsehood with it. So refuse those things. It, it's it's fiction based upon fact. Okay, that's that's probably, that's a description. But he said, and exercise thyself rather instead or above that, turn away from this other, but exercise for yourself the godliness. What is godliness? Godliness is not what we think. God is what we do. He said, but for godly exercise profited little. See, Paul, what is Paul not saying? Paul did not say that God that body exercise is not no benefit. I mean, common sense tells us if we take care of our bodies, they're gonna, they're gonna last a little longer. You know, we need to do we need to take care of our bodies. But he said it made profit little as compared to what? But godly uh, godliness profit uh, uh, unto all things. See, physical exercise is it's okay for the body. But when it put the spiritual things, it, it's no benefit to it. Very little benefit as compared to godliness, which is profitable into all things. What things? The things that Paul is telling Timothy. The things that he wants the church to understand. Having the promise, I love the gospel because it's got the promise he's talking about. It's got the promise of the life that now is, the promise of God's blessing upon the church. The gospel, the gospel talks about the blessings of families, the blessings of preaching, the, the blessings of, 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 of living according as a disciple, discipleship, the things that we have now, and, uh, and that which is to come. It also gives us the promise of eternal life. We have that in the gospel and the promise. <clears throat> He said, this is a faithful saying. Worthy of yes, ma'am. Worthy. Worthy means it's, 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 it's exalted. It, there, there's no reason to turn away. All acceptation. You know what that means? That means accepted. Well, Brother Thomas, are you saying we need to accept the gospel? That's what Paul was saying here. We need to accept the gospel. Not accept it in order to become children of God. But accept it because it's worthy to be accepted. It's worthy that we should accept it. Why is it worthy? Because God gave it. Because it's about Christ. It's about the church. It's about how we ought to live our life as we live in the kingdom of heaven. It's worthy of our acceptation. We should accept it. He said, for therefore we both labor. For this reason, Timothy, Paul said, we're, this is why we, we labor and we suffer reproach. You see, 
the, the thought occurred to me in the car coming down here today. I would much rather be at peace. I don't like trouble. I don't like people getting, you know, persecuting me. I don't like that. But I have found out that I don't grow in fruit, don't grow any fruit except I be first purged. It seems like we have to have hard times to appreciate the good times. When we have a good time, we forget where those good things come from. Paul says, therefore we both labor and we suffer reproach. And this is why. Because we trust in the living God. My daughter called me from Houston today. She said, I'm amazed. Uh, on her little blog or whatever the thing is that she does on the computer. She started putting on there about first what it says in, in Ephesians chapter 5 about being submissive to her own husband. She got the most negative feedback. You know, people just call and say, how, how dare you put that in there? Women should never be uh, uh, submissive to any kind of man. She said, I'm just amazed at how quickly uh, uh, the people, the uh, persecution came out of the woodworks as soon as I said something like that. <clears throat> he said, because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men. When I say all men, are we talking about every man everywhere? All of humanity? No, it's not talking about that. He's talking about everyone that Christ died for. He's talking about everyone that was given to Christ before the foundation of the world. And especially, especially, he says here, for all, all the elect, comma, especially, especially for those that believe. You know there's a special blessing for the church? <clears throat> Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1 real quickly. <clears throat> and we don't, I don't want to start with in the beginning because it, this is where it talks about being chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world that we should be holding without blame before I'm in love. But I want to pick up with verse um, verse 8. No, let's go to verse 7. In whom we have redemption. Who's the we? We he's talking about. That is uh, the saints at Ephesus and, and, and those that are faithful in Christ. That's talking about you and I. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. He's talking to the church. He's talking about you and I. Wherein he hath abounded toward us in the church, who believe in, in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will. See, when I, I know we're not talking about all of, all of God's elect here. But not all of God's elect have ever heard this before. But he has made it known unto those that believe. He's made it to the church. You've got this information. You've got something that you ought to treasure. He said, made known to us the mystery of his will. According to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation which, what is the dispensation of the, of the fullness of times? Today is one of those dispensations. It's a gospel dispensation. It's, a, it's, it's Sunday preaching. It's, it's studying the scripture. That's a dispensation of the fullness of times, plural, more than one, that he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. And that's for you. That's your benefit, your blessing in whom we have obtained an inheritance. All of God's elect have an inheritance. But we that believe, we that are in the church, we that are disciples, especially to those disciples, we have obtained an inheritance. We have something in this world, the world does not have. We have the church. We have the gospel preached. Being predestinated according to the purpose of him who work with all things after the counsel of his own will. I have people all the time come to me and tell me, well, Brother Thomas, but you know the word predestinated only appears in the Bible two times. Well, they can't count like I do. I count at least four times. And they say, well, if you talk about it only four times, well, I'll tell you what, it only takes four times. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Here's the fourth time. <clears throat> he worked with all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be the praise. Listen, to the praise of his glory who first did what? Trusted in Christ. We don't, we don't want to get the idea, brothers and sisters, that we don't believe in putting our trust in Christ. Sometimes we start talking about election. We start talking about predestination. Sometimes we get we give the wrong idea or we maybe we deceive ourselves into thinking that, uh, that, we, that we're not requiring people to believe in Christ. We are. But the evidence, brother and sister, belief does not, does not make you a child of God. 
Belief is evidence that you are a child of God. You're not dead in trespasses and sin. The dead know nothing at all. Let's get back over to Ephesians. I mean, uh, 1 Timothy. <clears throat> he says, These things, here's that word, these things again. These things command and teach. What things? Let's, let's go back. Verse 7. These are some of the things. But refuse profane and old wives' table, and exercise ourselves rather into godliness. For bodily exercise profitable little, but godliness is profitable unto, unto all things, having the promise of the life that now is, and that which is to come. And these things. Number 12. Let no man despise thy youth. When we talk about his youth, with Timothy, he was a young man. But not, this doesn't necessarily mean young in your age. He's talking about in your, his babes in Christ. Don't let anybody despise your youth, but be thou an example. Timothy, Paul said, you set the example, you set the pace. Be an example of the believers, not to the world. No, we are to let our light shine, yes. But the example that we set is in the church. It's among our brothers and our sisters and our families. Be, a, be a, an example of believers. You do it in your words, the things that you say, your speech, your conversation, your conversation, talking about your everyday social behavior, how you behave yourself. Do we behave ourselves in such a way that this would be said of us? In, in charity, remember, not love, but, the, but love in action, exercising godly love in spirit, in faith, in purity. He said, you do it until I come. Till I come, give attendance to reading. What, are, what else do we need to put in remembrance of? We need to be reading. How much time do we put in reading the scriptures? It, can, can, you, can, you, can you look and tell me how much time you devote on a day-to-day -day basis to reading the scriptures? Paul tells Timothy, you're setting the example. If you're not, if the pastor's not doing any reading and studying, he shouldn't be expecting anybody else to do it. He said, you set the example. We ought to be reading to exhortation. Exhortation has to do with encouraging one another, to instruct one another, to doctrine, to teaching and instruction. Not just from, not just from the pulpit, but sisters. Being, being godly women, instructing the younger women, as Paul said, to love their husbands, to be good mothers, to set the example, to, to teach the older men how we ought to conduct ourselves in the house of God. He said, neglect not the gift that is in thee. Brothers and sisters, we've all got gifts. There's not one person in this church that God has not given a special gift to that's unique to you. He said, don't neglect that gift. Some people is for preaching. Some people is for praying. Others for, we all got the gift of praying for one another. But encouragement. If you've got the gift to encourage somebody, encourage somebody, don't neglect that gift. If, 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 it's, if it's cooking, at lunchtime, bring, bring the lunch. Uh, encourage to get yourself to come together. He neglect not the gift that is in thee, which is given thee by prophecy. And this is an interesting statement. With the laying on of hands of the presbytery. How is the laying on of hands of the presbytery given by prophecy? Think, have you ever thought about this before? In what manner can it be said that when we ordain an elder or a deacon, that, that it was given to thee by prophecy? What, in what sense can we say that? I'll tell you what sense. We see it especially among the ministry and especially among the deacons. Have you ever been to the church and nobody had to tell you who the deacon was? You go in there and you, could, you see he does the work. You know what I'm talking about? Or, or the evidence of a, of a young brother, maybe not young in age, but young in experience, has got an interest in, 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 in preaching the gospel and you put him in the stand and you see that experience displayed. And others see that experience displayed. And they said, that brother right there is called to the ministry. You know what? That's prophecy. That's prophecy right there. By the prophecy and the laying on of hands, those brethren that say those things come together and form a presbytery and lay their hands upon that deacon and upon that elder. We need to bring our thoughts to a close here. Worked out pretty good. Verse 15. Meditate on these things. Meditate on these things. He said we need to be reading, but there's also time we need to meditate. That means after you've read, you need to take some time to think about what's been read. 
after, after the preaching service is over, you need to take some time to think about what's been preached. Go back and open the scriptures. Don't, don't take the preacher's word for it. Go back and see one of those things. Be like those Bereans who come together to search the scripture daily to see whether those things were so. Meditate on those things. Give, give thyself wholly to them. Did you know that the ministry is not a part-time job? I can't tell you how many people find out that I'm a preacher. And they'll say, well, uh, well do you get a salary? And I say, well, no, we don't believe in salary. Well, you're just a part-time preacher. I'll tell you, the ministry is not a part-time job. It's full-time. Being a deacon, Brother Dallas, Brother, uh, they're, they're not, we're not talking about money. We're not talking about part-time jobs here. We're talking about full-time. It's till you die. We're going to do this till we die. Give thyself wholly to them. Reading scripture, meditate the things that Paul wants Timothy to know. He said, give yourself 100% to these things and put the people in mind, mind of those things. That thy profiting, notice what he said, notice how he said this, that your profiting, your, as a preacher, as a minister of the gospel, that your profiting may appear to all. You know what he's saying? That they might see you grow in grace. They might see that gift that's in you to preach the gospel, watch, watch it grow. Take heed to thyself. I'm going to pick on Brother Randy because he, he, I, I've been watching his gift grow. And, and, and I'm not saying this to give him the big head. I, I believe you know me better than that. But I've been watching his gift from the first time that I got a chance to put him in his stand, watching it grow. And I hear others, other ministers that have heard, him, heard, heard his efforts in the gospel watching it grow. And they say, yeah, we, we've been watching that grow. That's what he say. Take heed to thyself and to the doctrine. Timothy, while why you're benefiting, to be careful, pay close attention to what you... You know, when you say something in this stand, I'm not, I don't mean this platform I'm standing on. I'm talking about standing before God's people. When we're standing before God's people, we need to be careful what we say. It needs to, it needs to be right on. If, 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 you're going to, if you're going to tell somebody it's an opinion, you better make sure they know it's an opinion. Don't you have to leave out of here thinking that you just quoted a description. That's an opinion. Take heed to thyself. Know what you're talking about. I had a fellow one time tell me one time, I said, Brother Thomas, I don't know how you, how you do your preaching, but I just, I don't study. I just, when I go to church, I just open my Bible up, and wherever it falls, I start preaching. I said, Brother, I don't do it that way. God told me to read, told me to study, told me to meditate on these things. Uh, uh, take heed to that. Be careful what you preach about. And into, into the doctrine, the teaching. Where do you find the teaching? It's in this book right here. The teaching. And continue in them. Do what you're doing, Timothy, and keep doing it. But it says you do what you're doing. Exercise your gift. Do these things. Continue in them. For in doing this, for as, as Timothy, as you do these things as a, as a minister of the gospel, he said, in doing these things, thou shalt both save thyself. This week, you know this is not talking about eternal. We're talking about the church of saints here. But there's a salvation in the gospel. Salvation from ignorance. That's why Paul said concerning his people in the 10th chapter of the Roman letter. He said, I bear them record. They have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. He said, I would rather be accursed for their sake that he might save some of those that believe. Not save them eternally, but save them from their ignorance. He said, continue in them. For in doing that shall save thyself and them that hear thee. It's important, brothers and sisters, that as we study the ministers, as ministers, that we study the word of God, that we first deliver ourselves from our ignorance. And we do that through prayer, through fasting, through meditation, through studying of the word. May the Lord bless you is our prayer. We're going to stand and sing a song.